Hi everybody, um, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you so much to the NAMS folks for inviting me. Um, okay, so uh, they asked me to talk about growing plants from seed. Okay, so I'm gonna try to do that without going on too many tangents, but really um, I have a lot of stories to tell you. So um, let's, let's start. So I'm from the St. Williams Nursery and Ecology Center. We are located in a building, a facility that was once owned by federal government. We were Canada's first forestry station. Um, sorry, the screen's a little bit cut off. Um, we were started in about 1909, and for you know, decades and decades after that, they grew nothing but conifers, a handful of species, mostly for northern reforestation. And then about six years ago, um, the nursery was privatized and converted to a completely native plant nursery. So we grow over 550 different species in any given year grasses, forbs, shrubs, aquatics, you name it, uh, we're trying to grow it, basically. So there's a photo of the nursery in 1919, and that, this house is still there. Our production manager, Scott, currently lives there, and I'm really jealous. I hope he, you know, <laughs> buys another house someday and moves away so I can live there. Um, <laughs> and, and not only do we have a nursery, which is about 10 acres under glass and other kind of lathe houses and things like that. But we have about uh, 90 acres in production around the farm, and in, it's in seed production. We grow native wildflower and grass seed as well. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about, more about that later. There's just uh, kind of one of the wings of the greenhouses. And, uh, and there's some seedlings coming up in the greenhouse. Who knows what kind of plant that is? This is the right crowd to test. <laughs> Um, so there's a little, there's a little hint, there's a little seed stuck to that spur. Yeah, that's really good. Who, who knows it? Can you give us a hint? Is it a milkweed? It's a milkweed, yeah. Um, so we grow a lot of milkweed. Can you imagine why? Who wants milkweed? Uh, everybody. does. This is actually Sullivan's milkweed coming up, which is a, kind of an uncommon one. I should mention now that, um, thank you, Harold, I'm an ecologist. I am not a horticulturist. I have no formal training in greenhouse management or plant propagation. Everything I've learned has been secondhand through our professional growers. Um, so I'll talk more about my job in a minute, but right now I really want to recognize our team of growers in the greenhouse who turn our seeds into wonderful uh, plants that we sell. Um, so we have two lead growers and they each have about three assistant growers, plus all kinds of other people who help out with watering and stuff in the greenhouse. So it really takes a really uh, big team pull off what we do. So as I said, I'm an ecologist. My, my interest in this business is in habitat restoration and species conservation. So um, I have a soft, soft spot, as do many of you probably, for spring ephemerals and woodland little wildflowers. Um, I kind of got my start in this realm studying a community of 52 wildflowers uh, and studying the patterns that occur in their communities and how that's tied to the pollinators they use. And as time went on, I became even more and more obsessed with plants, um, including the, the bean family. So the bean family is the fourth or fifth most diverse plant family in Ontario. Um, and nobody knows anything about them, really. A lot of them are endangered and threatened, and their numbers are declining really rapidly. And the only one anybody can really name is blue lupin, um, which is a problem because there's like 25 of them. Um, so there's some there. Go through, that's at risk. All kinds of different lespideses and things. So um, I also did a project then on the patterns that dictate uh, diversity within this group of plants. So which members of this uh, family co-occur, and why do they co-occur, and where you get rare plants, I, I will for sure. So right now at St. Williams, uh, I get to work on this plant. Not a great photo, sorry guys. Um, this is creeping tick trefoil, Desmodium rotundifolium. It is at risk in the province, and it currently grows uh, pretty much just around the St. Williams Nursery in the conservation reserve that's there. However, at some point in time, in the last mm, ten or so years, one of the plants managed to seed itself into our field into one of our tree rows. So, we have not done anything to those tree rows. We haven't lifted those trees. We haven't, you know, tilled in between the rows. And we're now collecting seed from this one individual and propagating it um, under a permit that we have through 
appreciate natural resources. So a bunch of things changed in 2008 when the species at risk laws came in. So it protects plants. So people can't just go out into the wild and pick seed, particularly of at risk plants like this. Um, however, many, many, many years ago, um, somebody collected seed from this plant. Oh, I have the name today. Okay, I was going to test you. Um, <laughs> And we've actually been babysitting these seeds and these plants for close to 20 years. Um, and so we can propagate them and grow them legally without a permit. However, we can't reintroduce them back into the wild because they're still incredibly at risk. I think there's only one population left in southern Ontario. Um, but we do have them for sale if you're a home gardener. So I'm just showing you these things to demonstrate that we're not only just a native plant nursery, but we're actually actively involved in conservation in the province. These are some other rare and uncommon plants that we grow. Um, that's an okay picture. That's a pawpaw flower. Has anybody seen a pawpaw, pawpaw flower before? Really cool. They're like big, big bell-shaped flowers. They smell like chocolate. They smell like chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, dragon, dragon's tongue, what's it called? Who's seen that one? Anybody? Mm -hmm. It's like scary as hell when you're walking through the bush and you're, you're being stung by nettles and stuff and then this giant plant like jumps out at you it's not actually moving but it looks like it could bite you it is pretty scary um, and then and then this one who knows this one it's kind of a crooked photo it's an elm it's not a white elm it's not red elm this is a rock elm uh, we, we refer to this as the dinosaur of southern Ontario. There are so few populations left and they're declining pretty rapidly. Um, there's nurseries up in the Ottawa region that have healthy populations that they are propagating up there. But uh, in southwestern Ontario, we only really have one population that has been surveyed in the last decade and that produces seed once every five years or so. This year I managed to collect two viable seeds, one germinated and then promptly died. Um, so we're, we're trying, we're really trying. This species isn't actually at risk, so there's nobody out there doing any formal recovery on it, which is a bit of a shame. Hmm. This is another plant that we grow. This is blue lupin. Once at risk, it's now um, you know, doing quite well, partially because <coughs> of its seed, believe it or not. It's really, really, really easy to get a wild lupin seed to germinate. And so we've been using it, and other people have been using it, in bulk seeding mixes to restore tens and hundreds of hectares at a time. And so these populations have really, really rebounded. Kind of a conservation success story, thanks to, thanks to seeds. Um, all of the plants that we grow, we grow from seed. So a lot of other nurseries will propagate vegetatively. We want to maintain genetic diversity within the species. So we go out into the wild, we collect seed and fruit, we process it, and we grow it all in-house. And the first seed of the year that we collect is this one. Dang, I put the name. <laughs> um, so that's a sycamore seed. And it's not just any sycamore. Like, it's a real sycamore. It's not the kind of sycamores that you see in downtown Toronto and downtown Hamilton. It's not a London plane tree. It's not a hybrid. It's not polluted by London plane tree genetics nearby. We go into the most remote river valleys in southern Ontario and find the biggest, oldest trees and collect the seed from under those trees. Um, so this is uh, a Big Creek floodplain near Walsingham, and it's, it's sort of a kind of a ritual. It's the first seed that we collect of the year. It's the first warm day, usually about the first of April, maybe the last week of March. We go out, and the fruits have been ripe since the fall but they've been hanging from the tree, getting rained on and snowed on, and eventually they will rot off and fall away in the heavy rain. So, let's just backtrack a little yeah. bit. We're doing a lot of plant growing, right? Seed growing. And what are we doing it for? Well, it'd be nice to say that we were doing it for the plants themselves. I mean, everybody here loves plants, but sometimes plants are a really hard sell. Um, so. By and large, mostly what we're doing is growing plants for birds. Let's be honest, that's where the funding is. That's what people really, really love, is birds, butterflies, but mostly birds. Um, particularly songbirds like bobolinks and meadowlarks. And uh, we can debate whether or not those birds should actually be here or not. Um, but, the, but the point is most of the habitat restoration we do is for these ground nesting songbirds. 
Um, a lot of it is compensation. So when a company wants to build a building or if the province wants to build a highway, they're required by law to replace that land, that natural space, with a restoration site somewhere else. So any, any land that's being paved or turned into a building needs to be compensated at a one-to-one -one ratio somewhere else nearby. Um, so we're doing a lot of that for the 407 extension right now that's uh, going east past with Whitby. Um, so they get us to do restorations, they get us to do plant salvages, we'll go and lift things up like orchids that are really, really tricky to propagate from seed, and we will move them. And so how do we restore habitat, a big habitat? It's not something that you can go in and plant plugs and pots, and coordinate a whole bunch of volunteers, because you'd be there at it for like a week. Um, so we approach it agriculturally. We look at that space as a field and we want to grow a crop. And that crop is native plants and birds. Um, so this first picture here is about one metric ton of oaks, like acorns, hickory nuts, uh, plum pits, and other things like that. Those get all mixed up and they get direct seeded on the back of a tractor. So this is a converted tobacco planter. So there's a, a tree mix using tree seeds. We also install wildflower seed and grass seed in separate mixes. And that photo over there that got a little cut off, that's a restoration about 10 years, no less than that, six years after it was installed. And that's a huge patch of blue lupin directly seeded uh, right next to a nice line <laughs> of oaks. So they went in in the line because they were planted in the tractor. Usually we do it in a crosshatch so we have a more natural distribution of, of trees. So that's after about six years up on the right corner there. Uh, but this is summer number one. So most of our restorations we do in very early spring, like middle of March, something like that, late March when the ground is still very wet and cold, uh, or late in the winter, like the first week of December, when the ground's not frozen yet, but it's all just cold and lucky. We do it at that time of year because all of these seeds all of our native perennial seeds need to be stratified. So they need that cue, that going through a winter period of cold and wet. Some of them just require a week, some of them require three months, um, but all of them do need that period of stratification in order to germinate in the spring. So some species that work really well direct sown and use a lot in our restorations are the penstemons, uh, hairy beer tongue and foxglove beer tongue. That's one of our fields there in Cold Bloom. We use a lot of brown-eyed Susan, Rudbeckia. Um, these species, not only do they germinate really, really well from seed, but they grow really quickly. They're kind of weedy, they're early successional, right? So when you're starting from a blank canvas, from nothing, you want those fast-growing, weedy native plants um, to keep the non-native weeds out. Basically, they're, they're filling space. And then some of the longer-lived, slower-growing things like asters and gold rods, they'll come and fill that space up later. So this is sky blue aster, or azure aster. Aster. We use a lot of this. Fantastic for butterflies, including the monarch butterfly. Um, so we, we do a lot of work for birds, this bulk seeding restoration. We're also doing a lot of work for butterflies. Um, as you can imagine, some people are very concerned about the numbers and population size of monarch butterfly, and so they're planting a lot of milkweed seed and plants, and we can't seem to grow enough of it. Uh, and this photo is taken actually in our, our greenhouse. Uh, we, <laughs> we don't use any chemical pesticides on any of our herbaceous plants. Sometimes on our woodies we use um, organic, so plant-derived chemicals, but we would isolate them for a time while we treat them. But in our main facility, in our production greenhouse, we don't use any chemicals. Um, we push our plants outside as soon as they're strong enough to tolerate outdoor conditions, and we really let nature deal with it. We let the wasps and the birds and whatever other predators come in and deal with the pests. And as a result, uh, for the last two years, we've estimated each year we've had about between 700 and 1,000 monarch butterflies lay their eggs in the greenhouse and form little chrysalises like this. Um, and it's because, not only because we don't use pesticides, but also because we grow a lot of milkweed. Um, not only common milkweed, uh, but we grow a lot of the rare milkweeds as well. Oops, I'm going to show you how we clean our milkweed, actually. <laughs> Who's ever tried to clean, like, more than one pod worth of milkweed seed? Yes. How did you do it? 
Uh, we took it into black garbage bags and shook it. Yeah. Or the other most fun way for me is to just stand out in the field and shake it and watch them all fly away. <laughs> nice. nice. Yeah, it's really tricky and kind of dusty and messy. Um, so we found what works best for us is a shop vacuum. <laughs> so we collect bags and bags and bags, and like you, we let them dry and then shake them in the bags to loosen it up. And then we pour all that fluff into a big pile. And then doing a small batch at a time, we run it through a shop vac. The fluff separates from the seed, take the fluff off, screen it through. Oh, you cut off the picture of our cat. <laughs> There's a cat right here that's really cute. Anyway, um, and we screen it, and then we get a pile of more or less clean milkweed seed. We would then just aspirate it. I'll tell you about aspirating today. I'll tell you about the cat later, too. Um, Sullivan's milkweed, which you saw a little seed running off at the beginning, um, that's a taller milkweed, kind of like common milkweed, but it's a bit more showy. It's a bigger, bigger flat top flower. Um, and then the swamp milkweed, which is a bit of a misnomer. You don't actually have to grow it in the swamp. I don't know why it's called salt milkweed. I guess that's where it's found most often, but it does well outside the swamp. And of course, everybody's favorite butterfly milkweed. <laughs> and yeah, we don't have any of this left. So if you haven't placed your order for the spring already, sorry, <laughs> we don't have any milkweed left. Um, everybody loves it so much. This is a giant swallowtail feeding at the farm. Mm -hmm. uh, literally, it's that big. Biggest butterfly out there. for birds, but what do we plant for birds? Not all birds nest on the ground, right? So there's the bobolink and the meadowlark, but there's a lot of other birds. So what are good things to plant for birds? Good things that are, things that are good for birds are also good for us. Mm -hmm. So food, think berries. Birds really like berries. There's all kinds of fantastic trees and shrubs and, and wildflowers you can plant uh, for birds. Um, and I have some of these here today. I brought some dewberry. Has anybody eaten a wild dewberry before? Mm -hmm. Fantastic. It's perfumey, like it tastes floral -y. Uh and, and a red, sorry, a purple flowering raspberry. Have you guys tasted those? Yeah, really, really sweet. And white strawberries. That is not an unripe strawberry. Yes. How tall does the dewberry get? The dewberry is actually a ground cover. Um, it does really well in dry, mostly shade. You can trail it up a bit of a trellis if you want. Um, but I've got it growing where I used to have periwinkle under a spruce tree. Seems to be doing quite well. I'm sure it would. Uh, it, it likes well drained soil. Thank you. So, um, like I said, we're collecting all these things from the wild, including all these uh, lovely berries. It's really hard not to eat them, um, but we have to collect them for their seed and then process them. So, um, seed collection is not all that hard. Once once you've got the plant ID mastered and you've got your locations scouted. Um, you then just need a few a few small tools to, to finish off the job. So any good native plant collector and grower will need a blender, right? All of these fruits need to be processed somehow and we do it with a blender. We also have like a large industrial blender called a Divvig. It's like a food processor almost. Um, and we put all of our berries and fleshy things through that. Um, you need a dissecting microscope because you need to check that your seeds are viable. You don't want to waste the time of cleaning them further, stratifying them, you know, planting them, watering them, and waiting for them if they were never viable to begin with. So check your seeds as soon as you collect them. Even if you've got a hand lens and a, and a pair of nail clippers, that's the best way to do it. So if, even if you're out in the bush, bush carry uh, a pair of nail clippers with you. Cut open the seed, even really tiny seeds. Have a look under the microscope. Most seeds should look like marzipan. Everybody knows what marzipan is. It's kind of like mashed potatoes meets walnuts meets it's almond, right? So nutty, but not necessarily hard. Some of them will be hard and look like a nut, but some of them will be a little bit soft and fleshy and look more like mashed potatoes, kind of. Um, and usually they'll have oil. So when you cut into them under the magnifying glass, you, you should look for a bead of moisture that comes out of that seed, right? Because you're cutting into the embryo. It's like a little life pod of the plant. Um, so keep an eye. If there's no moisture that comes out, your seed's probably dead. Um, 
you need a shop vac, not only to clean milkweed, uh, but to run your wall-mounted aspirator, which mounted, mounted on the wall, but it's run through the shop vac, will separate good seed from bad seed based on the weight and the density of that seed. So the vacuum sucks it up, and the heaviest seed falls, right? So the harder the vacuum is sucking, um, the more stuff it's going to draw out, but the heavy viable seed will fall and not be drawn up. Um, so that aspirator, you can get ones that have their own digital vacuum, but you can also get the wall mount unit that will hook up directly to a shop vac so that anybody can do it at home. Okay, you need lots of plastic bins and tin trays, like tin baking sheets. This is to let seed dry, etc. just to store it, keep it all separate. Um, usually seed is best dried on a, in a very thin layer over top of paper towels or other towels, so you'll need a lot of cans. Oops, sorry about that. A leaf mulcher. Um, this is to knock smaller seeds out of their casing, so out of their husks or their pods. Things like sedges that are encased in a perigenia, they want to come out of that. Um, things like Kentucky coffee tree pods you can even put through. We have larger industrial versions of a leaf mulcher. Um, we have a deep bearder, which is like a big concave with paddles <laughs> inside that will break up the pods. But I really like to use the leaf mulcher more than anything. It's super handy. Um, glass jars, better than Ziploc bags for storing your seed once it's clean. And vermiculite and perlite, those come in handy when you're stratifying seed moist in the fridge. You'll need lots of sieves and spoons to clean the seed. A cement mixer. <laughs> if, you, if you want to grow cherries and plums and other really thick fleshy fruit, the best way to do it is with a, with a, a really big rock tumbler or a cement mixer or something like that. You can't put them in a blender. You can't let them sit and rot because as the fruit ferments, it becomes easier to it becomes easier to clean off the seed. Uh, but the fermentation process creates alcohol, which may impact the viability of the actual seed itself. So even though it's easier to clean when it's kind of mushy and overripe, uh, it's not good for the seed. So putting it in a rock tumbler, you can just let it tumble for a long time is is better. Um, Towels, lots of towels. We go through, oh my gosh, I don't even want to talk about it. Okay, screens. <laughs> you can order all kinds of uh, custom sized screening. Small hand screens are the most general purpose, but larger screens also come in really handy too if you're cleaning things like milkweed. Um, and bleach. Again, we use jugs and jugs of bleach because we keep the lab sterile. It's important to keep all of your tools very, very sterile. A little bit of mold, a little bit of anything you don't want in your seed while it's stratifying in the fridge over the winter will potentially lead to mold issues. It'll undo all of that hard work that you've done up until that point to grow your or to get your seeds prepared for growing. So, um, you know, every plant has its ups and downs, but I'm going to go over my 10 favorite, least favorite plants to grow. These are all things that are pretty tricky uh, to deal with. Um, starting with the prunus species. So these are their cherries and our plums. They're really big, first of all, and the flush is really tricky to clean off of them because the seed case is kind of furrowed and bumpy, usually, you know, like a plum, plum pit. Um, and you really have to do get 100% of that flush off of the seed. So we put it through a rock tumbler first, I mean, sorry, a cement mixer first, and then the rock tumbler with sand and grit to polish them off. Um, otherwise, when we put them in a big sack to stratify them, they will mold almost immediately. Um, so most prunus species need to be cold, moist, stratified for about 150 days, give or take a few. Uh, after that period, we find it's best to pre-spread them. So that's take them out of the cold moist, put them in more of a room temperature in full light, and, but not too moist, and let them sprout. And then we plant only the spreading ones from there. It's very time consuming, very meticulous work. Um, yeah, you can use gibberellic acid to make them all kind of spread all at once. And we've tried it a little bit in the past with mixed results. So oak species are actually 
some of them are, are more difficult than others. Red oak is pretty easy. Um, but the thing that you want to be aware of is that there are two main groups in southern Ontario oaks. There's the white oak group and the red oak group. And it really depends on what species you have um, and how you're going to deal with it afterwards. So the white oak group, basically you have to plant that right away. Um, into what we would call field conditions. So you plant that into a pot and leave it outside, or you put it in a pot and put it into your fridge, something that's going to replicate winter in southern Ontario. Um, the red oak group can actually dry down a bit, so you can keep them more or less dry over the winter. Uh, we keep them in slightly moist peat, so we fill a huge bag full of peat, put the acorns in there, um, and then add just a tiny little bit of water. We don't want them to dry up completely, but we don't want them to mold. It really is a balancing act uh, with the red oaks. Service berries. Everybody wants a service berry. And, yeah. <laughs> the, the number one problem with service berries is that the birds like them too. And that the most productive native trees uh, the berries are really, really high up in the tree. Um, and so even when we use our cherry pickers and our load lifters and our ladders, we're only really ever collecting about a third of our biggest, most productive trees. We've tried netting, it doesn't work. Um, so basically, we have a team of six people that are on call every day when they're flowering and then every day when they're fruiting. The reason that we, we scout them every day when they're flowering is because a service berry can only be properly identified when it's in flower. Once it's gone to fruit, it's iffy. Um, so the, the tree form, the arborea and the latus, the smooth, they readily hybridize, they often look similar, especially the juveniles. So you have to see them when they're flowering in order to, to tell the difference. Um, some of the shrubbier species are a little bit easier to distinguish. Um, so yeah, we track them when they're flowering, that's tricky. We track them when they're fruiting, that's tricky because usually birds eat at like 5 a.m., right? <laughs> and by the time we get there, they've already had their breakfast. Um, but in the end, we do collect some. Um, they are kind of like the prunus in that they need to be cleaned very thoroughly in order to avoid molding, but they're a bit easier to clean. Um, stratification is pretty standard, cold moist for three to four months, um, and then after that, they're really easy to grow as a plant. As a seedling, they're kind of weedy almost. They're just kind of getting the seeds in your possession. That's the tricky part. Blue-eyed grass. Uh, this one baffled us until this year. Uh, so we kind of have a schedule, more or less. We try to keep to that schedule is when things get planted in the greenhouse, because it, it all can't be planted at once. We have limited stuff. So it turns out we've been planting this one at the wrong time. We've been treating it well, but we haven't been planting it when it was cold enough. So blue-eyed grass, even though it needs really warm temperatures to grow and flower throughout the year, and it loves kind of hot, well-drained sites, sunny sites, it will only germinate at very, very low temperatures. So that's the trick with blue-eyed grass. Uh, typical stratification over, over the winter, and then we have been sowing it into bulk trays, so these big trays full of dirt, and we just keep those outside. And that's really improved germination. So they germinate first thing in the spring. Um, so I had a request from Harold to include some spring ephemerals. And um, so I'm saying, I'm going to talk about bloodroot, but really this applies to most of our spring ephemeral woodland kind of wildflowers, trilliums, and things like that. Um, you have to sow them immediately. They do not make a very good bulk seed, so we never use these kind of plants and species in direct seeded restorations. Only, we only use the seed to grow plants in the greenhouse, and that's because they can't dry out at all. They have very, very thin seed coats, and they have to stay humid all the time. So we just give them, again, field conditions. We think, okay, trillium shattering its seed in late, late summer, early fall, we mimic the kind of leaf litter environment that those seeds would be going into in the wild, and we just give them that in the nursery. So kind of room temperature, moist-ish, but with good air circulation. Um, the other really tricky thing with these, with this group of plants is that they're slow to grow in the first few years. They're really slow to bulk up, um, and a 
lot of them don't transplant very well until they have good root resources and root masses. So that's really what makes these ones tricky to grow. New Jersey tea. Does anybody know this plant? Fantastic uh, native plant. There's a few different butterflies that rely on this as a host plant. It's really a shrub. It's not herbaceous at all. And it's kind of the best shrub you could ever have for an urban garden. It doesn't grow very big. It doesn't need full light. It flowers beautifully. Um, so I'm replacing all of the boxwoods along my driveway with New Jersey tea. Um, and they love to be pruned like a boxwood. Wait until they're done flowering and fruiting, and then you can go on with your hedge trimmer and, and prune them all off. And that will encourage them to push out and be even more lush. Falling. Talking about seeds, that's right. Okay. <laughs> the tricky thing with New Jersey tea is that its seed explodes. So when the pod is ripe, it has three little kind of uh, locules that will burst open and fling that seed. So you have to get to it before it shatters. But if you do that, it's really hard to clean because all those seeds are then in these little hard pods. So that's one that we use the leaf mulch on. So we collect it a little bit early, dry it down really, really, really dry, uh, and run it through the leaf mulcher to clean it. Um, it needs a, a cold moist stratification, but we find that if we treat it either with sulfuric acid or boiling water, that improves germination. Um, sulfuric acid tends to be a little too harsh, and that makes sense because this plant isn't really meant to go through the digestive tract of an animal, which is what sulfuric acid is supposed to uh, replicate. But the boiling water is a little bit safer. Um, yeah, a little bit safer. It's up to you which, which you use. Uh, but the sulfuric acid is definitely, definitely uh, the best method for growing Kentucky coffee tree seeds. So these, um, I'm not sure if you know about this plant, but they have really big pods, and it's expected that the, the natural kind of disperser of the seed is now extinct. It's probably an elephant or a rhinoceros or some other large herbivore that went extinct 10,000 or more years ago. Um, so in order to get these to germinate, we have to treat these with acid. Yes? I actually saw some in nearby area in the tropical. Yeah, they're, they're really great urban trees and they're planted all over the place. Um, but none of them have been dispersed naturally, as far as we can tell. Um, so they can be propagated vegetatively, but it's really easy if you treat them with acid to get them to grow. So as soon as you soak them in acid, it's literally, it's like overnight. Can you imagine that? 98% sulfuric acid overnight. <laughs> um, and that's what it takes to eat away the seed coat. And then the next day, they kind of, they change color and you put them in water and then they plump right up. So they absorb that water and they can't do that unless you get rid of the seed coat. You can also take sandpaper and rough off the seed coat, but we grow like 20,000 of these, so sandpaper is not practical for us. Um, or you can take a little knife and nick them. Look for kind of like the belly button on each seed, uh, which is like a little dent, and that's where the embryo will be. So don't nick that part, because then you'll kill the embryo. You want to nick where the endosperm is, so um, on the opposite side of, it's like a big round bean. So you just nick away from the endosperm, or from the embryo. Yeah, and uh, growth is improved, like with all legumes, if you add their specific rhizobium bacteria, which is like a symbiotic bacteria that forms with uh, uh, legumes in order, which makes them able to fix nitrogen. Viburnums. Um, there are, you know, viburnums are pretty common in the horticultural trade, but there's uh, quite a few native viburnums that are really lovely. Thanks. Sorry, guys. Um, so, like with a lot of the other fleshy fruits, you really have to get them clean um, to avoid molding. But these are really a big pain in the ass. These are a time suck. These require double dormancy. So they need to go through two different seasons of cold, moist, and then warm, cold, moist, and then warm, in order for them to, to sprout um, their cotyledons. So in the first year, they'll send down their roots and their radical, and then they'll just sit there like that, with a root sticking in the ground and no leaves. Um, and they'll do that forever and ever and ever until they get the second stratification period. So in order to do that to thousands and thousands of seeds is really tricky to go from warm to go from cold and moist to warm and moist. There's almost no way to do it without 
having to wash the seeds once a week. So we pick through the entire lot and wash every seed to avoid molding. Um, so I would I would not try viburnum if it's your first shrub that you're trying to grow from seed. Yes. Are you still so getting attacked by European viburnum beetles? I haven't noticed it. It's just not our plants. I'm not sure. Uh, the blue beech. This is a fantastic tree. Um, kind of has like a pagoda form almost to it. But the seeds are really tricky to grow. Um, they have mast years and off years. So some years there's seed, some years there's no seed. And uh, that's actually the flower. If you've never seen one flower, they're, they've got tiny little catkins. No petals or anything like that. Um, so they have to be collected a little bit green. If you collect them when they're fully ripe, they will go really dormant. <laughs> and to get them out of that dormancy takes a lot of work. Um, basically, you have to, with an X-Acto knife, peel off the seed coat from every single one. And we don't have time to do that. So we collect them a little bit green um, so that they can be uh, grown a little bit easier. Similarly, the ironwood, same deal. We've got to collect it early, early, otherwise it goes dormant and it's almost impossible to get it out of that dormancy. The other problem with this tree is that there are so few mature individuals that they produce seed, but we only ever really get like 25 seeds and we literally scour three counties. Um, so there are some places in Canada where I'm sure it's more, more prolific, but in Southern Ontario, it doesn't produce a lot of seed. But again, it's an ideal urban tree. It's tall and skinny. It withstands pollution and salt and all kinds of things. Um, I also had a request from Harold to talk about orchids um, because a lot of people want to grow orchids because they're so beautiful. And they are beautiful. They are, I call them a gateway drug. They are, <laughs> not, they're what got me in, interested in plants. When I was 13 years old, I was at Home Depot and I looked at an orchid and I was like, wow, that is cool. Um, these plants are doing everything that we do and so much more and they're just plants they're just sitting there but really they're alive and moving and orchids are really kind of uh, they're the epitome of, of of this i think because they have faces and so we really we really see them as characters and we, we really want to have them more than any other plant i think that's my theory is that they look like people so we kind of connect with them on a deeper level than other plants anyway um, so I had the, the wonderful pleasure of photographing the Calypso orchid and the, the ram's head up in the Bruce Peninsula. Who's, a, who's been orchid hunting in Bruce? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yes? And other places. And other places, uh -huh. yeah. You have to go. Oh my gosh. <laughs> if you like native plants, you have to go. Um, yeah, orchids are beautiful and people spend a lot of time and money to go and see them and, and stuff, but they're almost impossible to grow in your garden. They're not like house plant orchids, um, which are almost indestructible. They're really, really finicky. Um, the, the relationships that they form with bacteria in the soil, we don't even fully understand, but we do know that they don't tolerate disturbance very well. So most orchids, in fact all orchids, don't like to be transplanted. So don't even try it. I know some people say, well, I have a cottage and there's yellow lady slippers growing there. I'll dig some up and bring them back to my house. Don't do it. Nine times out of 10, it won't work. Mm -hmm. If it does work for you, you're lucky, but shame on you. You should all know better. Um, <laughs> I think there's one company in the States that's figured out how to grow native terrestrial orchids from seed. They need to be grown in completely sterile conditions with very specific symbiont bacteria present when they germinate. We're not there yet. <laughs> we're still trying to master the 550 other species that we're growing. So until then, I would encourage all of you to, to take the trip to the Bruce um, to go look at hunting. They're like literally growing up weeds, in this, like weeds inside the wood. We're not going to be tackling orchids anytime soon, but I want to <coughs> probably out of time soon. But I want to talk briefly about some of the new things that we're excited about growing. Who knows what that is? Oh, uh, um, twin leaf. 
That's very good. <laughs> this plant, in my opinion, looks much more beautiful before it flowers than when it actually flowers. Um, so this is first thing in the spring as it's blooming and the leaves are this weird orangey purple color. Um, mm -hmm. And this plant is not very common, but it's pretty hardy. If you've got clay soils and a bit of shade and a bit of moisture, it does quite well. Deer love it, and that's its number one enemy, is deer browsing and development, human development. But it, once it's out of sight, it's basically there forever. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things that I'm really looking forward to. We should have it next spring. What is that? What's the name? It's twin, twin leaf, yeah, not twin mm -hmm. flower, twin leaf. Thank you. Uh, Jeffersonia. Mm -hmm. It's so pretty. Uh, these two plants are both uh, spe oh, you can't see it. This is moss moss. So both of them are species at risk, um, which is cool, I guess. There's people doing some recovery strategies on them. However, you can buy both of these plants at garden centers, but they're not native. They are native-ish. They are from Connecticut or Ohio or California or something like that. They're not grown from the plants that actually exist in the wild in southern Ontario, which drives me nuts. There's all kinds of things like this that the government is protecting, protecting, and yet we're selling a non-native version of it at a garden center. And there's no way to get the native one easy to market. So we're really, really trying to work with the MNR um, to, to get these things to market. Now, most of you probably have moss flocks growing in your garden now very common spring perennial, um, and the wild type is actually native to southern Ontario. So wouldn't it be nice if we could actually sell it? If everyone's going to put it in their garden, why not put the local native genotype in your garden? Uh, and then this is birds from violet. Again, you can find it at garden centers, but it's probably grown from California genotype or Oregon or wherever else it's native to in the United States. And certainly it's not Ontario genotype. And then lastly, this is my favorite, other than the orchids, this is wood flocks, right? Blue wood flocks. Um, this is not protected, so we are allowed to grow this and sell this freely, and we will be doing so as of next spring. We will have four inch and one gallon pots ready for sale as of next spring. So that's, uh, that's some good news, and I would be happy to answer any questions Yes. I have a question. Just just so I got this right. Your wall mount aspirator, is that the same as a winnower? Mm, slightly different. So uh, an aspirator uses vacuum suction to draw yeah. up, yeah. and a winnower uses air current flowing over it. Slightly different. Very similar. Yeah. Yeah, so a, a winnower, like, like an old-fashioned winnower, did it inside the wind. And that's actually how we train all of our seed techs, is to clean the seed. So if you can master winnowing in the wind, you can do anything at St. Lambs. Um, and we, so we still do clean some things. Okay. It's just, yeah. that's okay. <laughs> and then uh, one thing that I was chatting about a little earlier, I'm never 100% about it as yet. So say if a person is to plant a species at risk in their garden, um, what would the implications be then in the future if they wanted to transplant or remove that that plant? As far as I understand, there are no implications. Yeah. This came up in the city of Hamilton recently when a school wanted to put in a vegetable garden. There was a Kentucky coffee tree next to it, clearly planted, but you know, the, the first contact bureaucrats said, oh no, you can't do this because of that risk, and they were following the rules, following the rules. But then when they through the outcome of that is that they were allowed to plant a veggie garden because that plant was not growing in the wild and it was established from captive stock. I see. Yes. And the reason for all this, could you explain a bit why why you have why there are all these rules around <laughs> the the rules are there to protect plants from pilfering and from development and from unsustainable practices. That's why they're there, to help the plants. Yeah. So there's also a bit of concern on their part about confusing future field botanists and, and, and biologists. Mm -hmm. So how did this rare plant get to this spot? We have no record of it being there 
you know, 10 years ago, how did it suddenly get there? Um, <coughs> my, my response to that is, well, that's why we keep records. <laughs> and that's why we have uh, ecologists working in conservation areas to keep track of these kinds of things. So we have herbariums and we have plant lists and those things need to be updated uh, because plants move naturally as well. Mm -hmm. We can also assist their migration to keep track of them. <laughs> Political, it's sort of hot. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Here, I have a question. Um, I've got truck lilies growing that I've rescued, but I can't get them. They keep coming up year after year, but I can't seem to get any of the flower. So I was wondering if there's some. They, they take longer than a trillion to go from seed to flowering, so part of it might be that they're not old enough. Yes. Uh, they might not be getting enough sun, I don't know. They do like to be sunny in the spring, right? Before the leaves flush out. Mm -hmm. um, but I know they take a while to bulk up. Yeah, when did you transplant? Well, oh, I'd say about two when you're talking. Yeah, that's that's a tricky one. Yeah. Sorry, the, the ones that we've grown from seed haven't flowered yet in the greenhouse either. Mm -hmm. yes. Harold. Oh. Uh, I read somewhere that it has to, they, they wait for so much uh, soil to be on top of the root. So maybe keep adding like amendments to it and build those in there. Thanks. <laughs> Any other questions? Awesome. Okay. Thanks everybody. Thank you.